Hey there, so I came back to this YouTube channel to have a little chat with you about the grand topic of client-side versus server-side web frameworks. And uh, I just came back from Portugal last night and, you know, my train got delayed and everything, so I didn't have milk this morning for my coffee. I'm in a great mood to talk about the pros and cons of different frameworks. And why do I want to talk to you about this today? Well, last week, um, or two weeks ago maybe, a whole Twitter thread started again between backend folks and frontend folks discussing pros and cons, well, discussing, uh, I would say rather fighting over uh, the pros and cons of, pro of server-side and client-side web frameworks. Um, the Hey calendar in particular was uh, criticized for its not responsiveness and then DHH got involved of course um, protecting its own little child and yeah as DHH does um, he's not subtle with his criticism so that started a whole discussion where also Theo got involved he looked at it um, from his from his own perspective and he made a really good video about it so if you want to watch that one it is called Rails deserves better, and he goes into the whole discussion a bit more. But then Elixir got involved, or Live View got involved, because Ryan Florence, um, yeah, he got called out by Yuse, and um, he, you know, Yuse asked him to review the Live Beats, Live View web app, and to break it, you know, to also apply the same scrutiny that Theo and others um, applied to the Hey Calendar to a live view app, which is a server-side render that. Ryan looked at it, um, yeah, he, I, I actually, after I, I read his, uh, I watched his video, I got a little bit upset because I was like, yeah, you kind of broke the web app, like you, you broke the app, not the framework, you know? But then I watched some of his other videos about other uh, demos that he reviews and uh, I understand now that he's more on the side of looking at the product and just, you know, playing around with the product and to see whether he can break it or not instead of looking at the underlying framework and kind of like, you know, breaking that one. So that was nice, though, that the discussion happened. Uh, it was a little bit heated, as all discussions on Twitter are. So I wanted to take today to have a little chat with you about what are client-side frameworks, what are server-side frameworks, what are server-side rendering, client-side rendering, static side generation, uh, optimistic updates, what is all of that stuff? So what is the, the foundation here, the technological foundation that we talk about in this, um, in this discussion? All right, and I think it is important to first understand the underlying problem that every web framework tries to solve. And the underlying problem in 99% of the cases is that you have some persisted state somewhere and you need to make that accessible for your users. So persisted, persisted state. And this state might live in a database or it might be a file that you have on your, on your hard drive or it might be in a cache, like a memory cache somewhere or anything. But it's something you persist and it's something you can't just give access to to your users. You can't give them a direct database connection that they can use to query and update this uh, data. You have to kind of control the access to it. And yeah, on the, on the other side, on the, the, like on the, the other side of the equation, you have your user and the user sits at home and wants to access the information through a, usually it's a browser in our situation because we talk about the web. And yeah, they're going to use it. And then in between the user and your system lies something called the internet. All right. And this is a barrier that you will have in every web application, you know, unless your user physically plugs into your server, there will be something like a network, in this case, the internet in between your browser and this part here. And what you have on the other side of the internet is usually a server that will, uh, yeah, get your request, like it will receive the request from users for viewing or updating or modifying the persistent state. And this is also where you do all the uh, authentication of the user. This is where you do the business logic, the way you apply the business logic to, uh, to check that your persistent state will always stay in a, um, in, a, in a good state. You know, it will not be compromised. It will always stay consistent with your business logic. 
All right, so now if you want to give access to your persistent state to your user, usually you add some HTML or you render some HTML in the browser over here, and then the user can interact with that HTML and uh, you know click a button, uh, submit a form or something. And that's already that brings me already to the first point of this discussion. Like when I listen to people who advocate client side frameworks like SPAs, you know, like uh, React or Next.js or Remix. Um, Sometimes they like pretend that there is no delay. Like th sometimes they pretend that their apps don't need to talk through the internet to the server and update the data. You know, it kind of like seems, oh, you know, if you press this button, immediately the modal pops up. Well, yeah, but if you submit the modal, you still need to wait until the server receives your data, updates something in the database, and then you know returns a response. So oh, every interaction. Almost every interaction, but you know, I'm I'm getting I'm gonna get to the more nitty gritty details later. So at almost every interaction you have between your browser and the server goes through the internet, and there are always like two major protocols that people use nowadays. One of them is HTTP, and the other one is WebSockets. And yeah, these two protocols they are used in almost all web frameworks nowadays. They're the, the standard, you know, that, that we all use. So it doesn't matter which framework you uses, use. Like if you use a server-side rendered framework like Live View, if you use something uh, client-side rendered like React, they all will need to use HTTP requests and WebSocket or me WebSocket messages to communicate with your server, to wait for a response, and then, you know, to show that response to the user. That is with all of them. Now... The waiting time until you get the response, you can make that waiting time prettier or less pretty, right? Sometimes you just show a spinner until you get you get a response, or you can already update the HTML in the browser without waiting for the response. And that is called optimistic updates. Okay, so this is something, a technique you can use in your front end to update your HTML before you even get the response from the server, you know? So you, you submit like uh, the calendar entry um, and you already show it in, in the front and in the, in the grid. And then only later you will get the server response that actually says, well, yeah, I actually created this, um, this calendar entry. Now, this optimistic update thing, that is something where the web frameworks differ. Like this is something that, yes, client-side frameworks can do better than server-side frameworks. But you know, there are some some shades, some grades to this. Like it's not a black and white thing where server-side frameworks can't do optimistic updates and server-side frameworks can. Like it's not that, you know, only one side can do it and the other is not. But we will get to that a little bit later. Now where these frameworks differ is um, basically where they fall on this divide between the internet, uh, like yeah, of the internet. Do they fall on the front end side? Or do they fall on the backend side? Let me add a new thing here on the right. Now, if you have a server-side rendered framework, so server-side rendered, these server-side rendered frameworks like Live View or Hotwire, they compile the HTML on the server and then send it to the user through the internet. Let me just extend this a little bit. So they basically, they take the data from the persisted state and then they render the HTML and they send it back to the user. Okay. And whenever the user interacts with the HTML, you know, they, they mostly send WebSocket connections, but they can also send HTTP requests. So they, they send some kind of um, request to the server side render framework, this one processes the request and sends it back to the, the user. Okay, this should be better. And this is what a lot of front-end folks or client-side rendered folks criticize. They say, well, whenever I submit a button or a form, I have to wait for this request here. You know, this goes through the internet, it is handled by the server, the server might create the, the you know, calendar entry, and then respond with a yes, 200 or 201. Um, I created a calendar entry and then it sends back the updated HTML to the user. 
also here there's some you know nuances so but this is like the, the basis you have the HTML being rendered on this on the server side and then only the HTML is sent to the front end and not just plain data now where the front end people differ from the the back end uh, from the server side rendered people let me just extend this a little further is that they add a whole new layer to the front end here and they they render the HTML basically so this is client side rendered and this might be something like react or next.js which is basically react uh, remix others view um, angular what's the other one I forgot svelte so many clients that rendered frameworks and yeah well, let, let me add this to this side here now what the client side rendered people do is they only get the data from the back end so they request the data like get data and this is most often it's json json format and then based on that data they render the html and they just replace it in the browser so this way the html is maintained by the clients by this framework on the browser like so like when you update the HTML it is right there you know if you show a modal uh, and you need to render the modal for whatever reason it is done all on the browser of the of the user it is done almost instantaneously whereas if you do it on server-side rendered there has to be a request to the back end uh, to the server and back and only then you know like the browser will update the HTML whereas with the client-side rendered the updating is almost instantaneously again however this only holds true if the client side doesn't need to wait for the server to respond right if it needs to respond it is exactly the same as the servers that render it, there's also in a, a request in between they need to wait until the, until the server you know acknowledges the request sure like you send json instead of html back all these kind of things like you know but the principles here are the same like there's always a network request if the user for example submits uh, a form and yeah again this is something that I often see um, being neglected all of these frameworks need to deal with the internet in between all right now the advantage of the client side render things is with one particular state which is not persisted let me let me show you what I mean so next to the persisted state you also have temporary state and uh, temporary is maybe not a good word, but I, I would call it UI state, but the UI state is also a little like it's a tricky word because people might say, well, the data I'm seeing is the UI state, but it's actually the persistent state. So what I mean with UI state is just stuff like, you know, whether here this drawer is open or not, whether I click this button or click this button, whether I open the side drawer on this side, you know, all these things that are irrelevant for the persisted state like I don't need to store that data in my database maybe I need I need to but that's part of my use case but usually it's not the case just like you know I open the drawer here okay it's instantaneously there if my internet connection is slow like opening these drawers might need to make a call like this would be a call to the server the server would say well yeah you should open the the, the drawer or like the the modal here and only then it shows right like if I have if I have a server-side render framework unless I optimize for it like clicking for example the library button here would be a network request to the backend the backend would say well yeah sure you should uh, show the site drawer and this is the HTML and then I, the, my browser would receive back the HTML and then render it and this is what a lot of client-side people criticize you know they say well the interaction isn't smooth because there's an inter the, like a network request in, in between and I agree you know this is like this clicking this uh, modal or like this drop down or this drawer like it should be instantaneous and if my internet connection is bad you know still the the drawer should open immediately there's no reason for me that i should wait for this like that i should wait for a server to to render this for me yeah and this is again this i think is the main point that client-side rendered people criticize about server-side rendered frameworks however what they like what they look at the, the the core 
data, you know, the, the core thing that they are concerned about is this particular state, the UI state, the temporary state, you know, whether this thing is open or not, whether this thing is open or not, whether I can open this modal here, right? And yeah, that is different from the persisted state. So don't confuse these two things. Like whether or not you can open a drawer instantaneously or not, doesn't matter, like it doesn't matter for your web framework whether it can or cannot change, modify, uh, and, and retrieve the persisted state. Right? And, and that is something we need to take into account. Like this is something you need to keep in mind when people criticize server-side rendered frameworks. All of these web frameworks, they can modify the persistent state. All of the server-side rendered ones can easily change the persistent state, retrieve it, update it, whatever. Client-side rendered ones, not so much actually. It's much harder to change your persistent state in the database if you have a client-side rendered framework like React Basically, you can't, right? Like, you need to have a server. You need to have some backend code here that handles all these requests. And yeah, immediately, you know, client side rendered ones, they're like, you know, this, the, the most important state of the whole system is the persistent state. It's the business state that lives in your, in your database, right? So, like, having client side rendered frameworks, is, they're great for the UI state, for the temporary state, you know, for showing models and whatever, but they're not great for actually doing the business stuff. You know, they can't do it without a server. Again, a lot of nuances there. And I think that is something to keep in, in mind. This is really important. Server side rendered frameworks, they make it really easy to change your business state. And most often these are already very established um, languages like Rail, like Ruby on Rails or Elixir, um, PHP also, that offer you this framework. So you already have a really powerful backend language that has all the libraries you need to build a very complex uh, backend application. And then on top of that, they already give you the server-side rendered framework where you can now also, where you can now also render the browser, the, the HTML in the browser. So it's a very nice extension of previously only backend focused frameworks to now having interactive dynamic front ends as well. So server side rendered ones make it really easy to change your persistent state. Client side rendered ones make it really easy to change your temporary, the UI state, right? Um, they make it really easy or make it much more possible to create very rich user experiences. And this is the important part here. This is a decision you need to make for your use case and your project that you're working on. How rich does my user experience need to be? Right? If you have something like Google Docs, for example, where you have collaborative work on a single document and a lot of buttons and you know a lot of UI stuff, yeah, that is a very complex um, experience that you need to support with the framework of your choice. So in that case, a client-side rendered framework that then uses a, an API in the backend to get and, and update the data might be the best solution. However, if you decide, oh, you know, the, the project I'm building, it doesn't need to be super fancy. It literally just needs to be a form. Well, why then would you go for a client-side rendered framework if you could get it out of the box with a server-side one? because the persisted state is much more important in your use case than the temporary UI state, right? And that is also something that Chris McCord, he mentioned in his keynote 20, in 2019 when he announced Live View, which is basically you need to find on this scale between basic UX and rich UX where your application should lie, right? Um, Chris didn't say we don't need any SBAs anymore, he said, well, you need to decide for yourself, you know, what is your use case? But in many, many cases, our use case doesn't need a user, a very rich user experience. In many cases, it is enough to have forms and tables about which I created a video course and uh, also wrote a book. Um, it's very, you know, that's enough. Like your user needs to be able to access the data, to update it. And that's it. And then your business use case, your business case actually is, is, is happy, like it's satisfied. In these situations, yeah, maybe just go for a server, server rendered framework, right? But of course, yes, there are also applications which are super complex um, that need to have a front end state that, you know, can 
um, immediately react to the user input and have like uh, optimistic updates, for example, you know, because it needs to be super um, snappy, the UI, so to say. Now, and what Live View did in the last couple of years is to push the boundaries of what Live View can give you in terms of a rich user experience. Because when, when they started, when Live View was first announced, it was pretty basic. I mean, you know, in comparison to what it is now, it was already mind blowing at the time, but you know, in comparison to what it is now, it was pretty basic. And even Chris said you know, when he started writing the the Live View framework, you know, he just re-rendered the whole page on every request, and then he made these chunks smaller and smaller and smaller to optimize the the data that needs to be sent over the wire for every interaction. And then eventually, also um, Live View added the JS module, where now you can easily show and hide drawers and modules and so on, all using JS. But you actually don't need to write JS. You know, you just have Elixir code that you can use to execute JS commands, right? So, you know, when when uh, Live View was first released, maybe like this is the ceiling or the boundary of user experience that it could. Um, support, right? So you have, like if your user experience would fall on this side of the scale, life you would be a good fit. If it would fall on this side of the scale, it wouldn't be, you know, and you should rather reach for an SBA. Over the years though, like Chris and the whole team, they have done really great work of changing this boundary, like moving it slowly, 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 all the way to the right. You know, by, by giving the JS command, by optimizing the, the um, data that is sent over the wire, uh, you say also was a big part of this uh, this work. Um, yeah, and so, you know, the boundary always moved further, further to the right. So more and more use cases would fall on the side where live view is actually a very viable option. And that is the, the great work here. Now, this has all been, you know, about the fundamentals. Um, there's one last thing that I wanted to mention, which is kind of how these frameworks now all seem to be trying to bridge this gap here, like to bridge the gap between um, basically backend and front end, like here the server side and the client side, right? Because what you what you got with server side rendered frameworks is they come with a client side rendered framework out of the box, kind of like they render the HTML for you, they um, update it in the browser for you, you know, they, they do the mutation um, and so on. So like they came with a very basic framework there and they are, have ex have been extending that client side framework off of themselves. And so, so the thing is here, what they did is like they, they tried to breach the gap of um, the front end and, and back end. And I've also been seeing client side rendered frameworks doing the same. And I just want to say, you know, if you now pick a new framework, you if if you pick either side, it doesn't mean that you can all, that you have to stay on that side. You know, if you choose a client side render, it doesn't mean that you can never update the business state from the same code base. Uh, and the same goes for the server side rendered ones, where it doesn't mean that you can never update the temporary state from that framework, right? So they have been doing a lot of work there. The client side renders also have been doing a lot of work there, and uh, I particularly like Remix. Um, because yeah, they they have everything in one file basically, where you render uh, a form, for example, and then you also r render or write the action that should be performed on the backend for it. So they make it really easy to write really rich user experience in React format, but then also to write you know backend code that you can run with Node.js on on your server. Um, so you know a lot of these frameworks they have been trying to to bridge this gap. You also see uh, Next.js, for example. You know they do they do the same now, where um, you also have clients that rendered, but servers that rendered, and uh, yeah, basically where you also write the the backend code in the same code base as the front end. So this is a you know this is where you see that like the the client side ones they always go further into the backend side. And the backend side, they go always a, a bit further into the, the client side part. Well, and until now, I've been talking quite positively about all these kind of things. So I would like to take a couple of minutes to talk about the negative things that, you know, both these approaches have. And because server-side rendered frameworks have been quite, um, 
yeah, in the focus lately, I would like to start with those. Now, obviously, the criticism that server-side rendered frameworks make user interaction slow, it is true. However, it depends on how you build it, right? So if I, you know, make opening this um, this drop down here, if I make that an HTTP request to the backend to ask, hey backend, can I open the the drop down or not? And the backend needs to respond to that. Yeah, no, that's that's not great, you know. And then if my internet connection is slow, I will click here, nothing will happen, and then only like two seconds later, maybe this thing opens. It's terrible, you know. That's why I said earlier that a lot of these frameworks now they also extend their client side rendered or the client side framework uh, to allow that these interactions are super fast. So that is that is one downside. Um, you need to be like it's much easier to shoot yourself in the foot with a server-side rendered framework if you only develop locally, you know, and and you make this an HTTP call or like a web server connection. Um, and this is also what what Theo, for example, like he criticized because you know somebody opened a modal here in in the Hey calendar and then it took like two four seconds to open to show you know this is literally where you open a modal and then the HTML needs to be fetched on the back end. Like this is not great. This, this is bad user experience. Um, however, it was fixed eventually using JavaScript, you know. So this is how, how it went. And um, let me go back here. Right, so this is uh, the major criticism. And it's true, you know, but it is being mitigated now. The other criticism is, of course, that you can't write super rich user experiences with server-side rendered frameworks, and that is true as well. This is what I, I showed here, right? But you... You need to be like you need to be conscious about where on the scale does your use case fall, and you got to be honest about it, right? Because not everything needs to be as interactive as a Google Doc. Like most of the things we build are just forms and tables anyway. All right, this is server side rendered. Uh, another like personal experience I had with um, server side rendered web frameworks is that it's much higher, uh, harder to hire for them, like proper front-end people who do client-side work with React or something, they rarely want to take on jobs in Live View, for example, and then only build Live View because, first of all, yeah, it's not as exciting. Second of all, it's not great for your career because you lose connection to React and, and what's going on there. Um, and you also don't really become a proper back-end engineer because you only do the Live View part. So it's hard to hire for these positions. However, you know, the back-end engineers can take over that work and, and you know if, if they're handy enough with CSS to build some front ends um, if you have a designer usually that also works out pretty well you know but you gotta you gotta hire a little bit differently if you want to use such a framework you gotta hire more full stack oriented backend engineers and you can't just have this divide where you have a very professional front end and a very professional backend engineer you rather need to have like full stack engineers so that's another another problem here now let me yeah go to the server side render now because um, one of the biggest issues of client-side rendered frameworks is that they kind of duplicate the persisted state in the front end. So they have their own little version, their own little um, data set of the whole persisted state, you know, not all of it, just part of it, and they work based on this data. And they update the data through the get, you know, through the HTTP request with the backend. But the problem here is that you know, it can easily get out of sync with a persistent state. You know, if, if another user updates this state, we need to update it also in, the, in every client that is currently running uh, and so on. It, and, and also just handling it in, um, in the front end means that you also mostly need to duplicate business logic. Because, for example, if you have certain logic, for example, for a calendar event, that the start date can't be before the, back, the end date, um, well, you know, it's pretty basic, but it is business logic that needs to be always correct in your database. You can never persist an event that has the end date before the start date, unless, you know, time zones and um, and the, the leap day, whatever. Like, there are a lot of exceptions, of course. But, like, in general, <laughs> there's some validation here that you also need to apply in the front end. So you need to duplicate it to the front end, and then whenever the user inputs some data, you need to check that validation um, immediately here, and you need to duplicate the, the logic also in the back end, right? So now you have two places where you have business logic, one's in the front end, one in the back end, and yeah, that already adds so much more complexity. Now the second part is that um, you need to mostly, um, not always, 
but often you need to have two different code bases one for the server, so like that's usually a backend language, and then you have a front end that is, you know, a, a, a JavaScript mostly, well, actually only JavaScript or TypeScript. Um, so out of a sudden, you have two code bases, you need, usually need to hire two different engineers, you know, a backend engineer, front end engineer for those. These two people or this group of people, they need to coordinate their work. The backend person needs to offer the API that the front end person needs. Um, and so on and so on. You know, if there's like business logic again that needs to be um, like implemented, both people need to implement it in the same way, which is also not e diff like easy, you know, when it comes to like data um, passing, for example, like in JavaScript, you need to have a, a date time with a time zone and then in the back end you handle that differently and these two things don't match for whatever reason. Like th there's a lot, of, a lot of detail here, right? And immediately, yeah, you need to have two people doing this job instead of one back-end engineer. Again, you could also have a front-end engineer that takes over the back-end. However, what I showed you, like the, the Remix, uh, Next.js, like their back-end functionality is usually not enough for a proper back-end application where you, you might need to pull in other um, technologies like whatever, message queues, caching, um, different database connections, and so on. So, you know, that is the, the second part where you immediately have a code base split um, and then you need to have two engineers working on each and they always need to synchronize their work. It makes everything slow as well. You know, you, uh, you, you don't have one person building the whole thing like from the model to the database uh, query, but you have two people and they need to coordinate in the middle. And from personal experience, I can also say that it is much harder for a backend engineer to care about the product um, if they don't build the front end themselves as well. Um, I had that situation where for two years I was merely building API endpoints. And it was fun work, but you know, if you don't, if you never see the product, like how it interacts with the APIs, or like you might only see it a week or two later when it hits production, and then you actually need to go and, you know, test it yourself. Like you need, need to make it a point to actually see the front end part to your back end work. It makes it much harder to just care about the product, to see the little nitty gritty details that can go wrong, you know, maybe if you build the front end, you immediately see that your data representation doesn't really fit your use case because users input the data differently than you expected. But you wouldn't like know about this, like the front end person doesn't know about your database schema and you don't know about the front end schema, right? So that is also a thing where I realized ever since I've building full stack applications myself, like indie courses, my video course platform, and also client work, um, I realized that you just you just find these issues easily if you do full stack development. Uh, I wanted to point out one extra thing here uh, for the ex for the server side render things. So there's another negative that I forgot to mention earlier. Um, it also depends on how the server side rendered framework does this data. Um, transport. Because if you look at Hotwire in, in Rails, for example, they replace whole chunks of HTML when they update, right? So like you have a little form and it needs to be updated, they replace the whole HTML. Again, the optimizations that you can use, but I think by default, they will just replace the HTML. So they need to send the whole HTML over the wire, uh, which is in much bigger in size. Um, and also they use HTTP, there are some WebSocket implementations you can use, uh, but what I've seen in, in, in the demos is you use HTTP calls, and HTTP calls are almost always less performant than WebSocket messages because they have to go through the whole stack of authentication, uh, you know, passing uh, your whole your whole stack, like all the, the middleware that you need to execute uh, when a request comes in. All of that needs to be executed for every single request, you know, for every single button click, navigation, whatever. Um, and then they send HTML back, which is much bigger and in, in larger in size um, than the raw data that you need to change is. That is something that Live View, for example, does much better. So you see the nuances in the, in the server side rendered frameworks as well. With Live View, you use WebSockets, so you don't have the overhead of making HTTP calls for every change in your HTML. And they don't send back the whole HTML, they only send back the actual data that changed. So if you have like a number on a page and the number changes, they will literally only send the new number and not the HTML around it. That is an advantage of Live View. Um, 
because it uses Erlang and it starts a new process for every single client that connects to your server. And in that process, they can also save like cache data. You know, that's another advantage where you don't need to go to the database for every single request and fetch the same data. Um, you can keep that in, in memory and then work on, on that cache. So that is something that Live View already, I think, does better than Hotwire. So you see, like, you know, there, there can be cons to the server-side rendered framework depending on how they designed their, their approach. So this video is already long enough, and I hope you got my points and everything. One last argument I wanted to make, um, which, you know, also, like, takes off the edge of the whole discussion a little bit, is that even client-side rendered frameworks nowadays do a lot of server-side rendering. And the reason for that is Google indexing. If your website is on, on the public internet, so it's easily accessible and you don't need to log in, Google will try to index it, right? And if you want to be indexed on Google, you basically have to return the pure HTML to the crawler of Google. So they make a request to your website. And then, yeah, maybe if you use React, actually, that's an issue I learned. Um, so if you return just... Like if, if Google asks your React website to return the HTML for the, for the website, yeah, React doesn't, like it builds the HTML only when it's fully loaded. So it only returns a very empty uh, HTML document. And, you know, the, the, the solution for that now is, for example, Next.js, which is known for server-side rendering, and they also do static site generation where they generate the entire document uh, and they just keep the HTML in, in, in memory, which is great for blocks, for example, and any static, um, like uh, any static content. And even Remix, I, I learned, uh, although it was a little, like I need to, to, to read, read to the document, they don't like fully say it. Um, they also do the same. You know, if you have a Remix website, actually I went to the, uh, to the showcase here and I think I went to Shopify. And if you look at the, the website here and you look at the document that you receive, it is also a fully generated HTML um, document that then Google can use you know, you see it down here, that Google can use for indexing the website, right? Actually, oh, I have a slow throttling on. Um, yeah, so even these front-end, the uh, client-side rendered frameworks, they do an initial server-side rendering for the HTML, and then after the HTML is sent to the browser, then they hydrate it, so they make it dynamic, and they add all the JavaScript to it. Uh, but yeah, still, like, you know, we're all kind of trying to solve the same problem in different ways, in di with different approaches. But at the end of the day, we all try to solve our users' problems and you know make them happy. So that should be our main, main goal. Now, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got something out of this. And um, just, you know, the, the main conclusion here is like, if you need super rich UX, of course, go for client-side rendered framework. See whether you need a backend as well. Maybe you don't need a backend, so you can use the, the client-side like extension uh, into the backend for updating the position state. Uh, if you don't need a super rich UX, maybe get server-side rendered frameworks to try. You know, Live is here to welcome you with uh, open arms. And I'm also here. If you have any questions, you can follow me on Twitter. It's PJ Ulrich. Um, I have a blog on peterulrich.com and a startup at indiecourses.com for selling your video courses. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm not very active on YouTube, so, you know, you can subscribe to the channel, but I probably won't upload anything in the next years, months, I don't know. So better follow me on Twitter uh, to stay updated. All right. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.